State your full name and spell your last name, please. My name is Stephanie Menendez, M-E-N-E-N-D-E-Z. And Ms. Menendez, where do you work? I am employed at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation as a forensic chemist. And uh, how long have you worked for the crime lab? I have worked there since August 2012. And um, since uh, 2012, um, what is it that you actually do at the crime lab? What does a forensic chemist do? At the crime lab, I analyze samples brought to the agency by law enforcement agencies uh, for the presence or absence of a controlled substance. If I can get you just to move a little closer, thank you. Um, what sort of educational background do you have that allows you to do what you do? I graduated from the Georgia Institute of Technology with a bachelor's in science and chemistry. All right. And do you belong to any professional organizations? I am part of the CLIC. And what is CLIC? CLIC is Clandestine Laboratory Investigating Chemist. And have you ever um, taught others in the field of forensic chemistry, um, either formally or informally? Yes, I have. And, and tell the jury about those occasions. Um, I have taught another chemist on how to perform a peer review. All right. Have you ever um, testified as an expert before? Yes, I have. In, in what field? In forensic chemistry. All right. And um, how many times have you testified as an expert? Approximately 10 times. And what um, jurisdictions or courts have you appeared before? Um, I have appeared in Catoosa County, in Gwinnett County, and DeKalb County. Your Honor, at this time we would like to tender um, Ms. Menendez as an expert in the field of forensic chemistry. Your objection. Uh, Your Honor, I'm looking at the state expert with the listen. I don't see Ms. Melendez, or, or unless they got something new, I'm looking at the expert witness list, sir, and, and I didn't have that on them, unless they got something. She's going to get new witness list, sir. Um, Your Honor, can we take this matter uh, of outside for us? in the identification of the substances found in the car. Initially, Ms. Amber Sloan is the one that uh, did the original test for the cocaine. She was the one that did the peer review. Um, there are several cases on point that when a um, crime lab uh, forensic chemist or uh, other related scientists is unable to appear, either they have left the state and quit their position or for whatever reason. The individual that did the peer review is able to testify in their, in their behalf. As long as what the cases discuss is as long as they're just not a mere conduit of hearsay. And in this case, I would proffer to the court. I would anticipate Ms. Menendez in saying that she reviewed all the analyst data and that she looked at that data and arrived at an independent conclusion of Ms. Sloan, which actually agrees with Ms. Sloan's um, testing. In addition to that, under her, 
I mean, OCGA 17-6-8. The courts discuss that um, the trial court has a discretion with regard to allowing a witness that wasn't on the state's witness list. And some of the things that the courts have discussed in these cases is regarding whether um, the defendant is somehow surprised by the witness. I would submit to the court that she's going to testify to a lab report that they received. Therefore, there's really no surprise as to the subject matter of her testimony. Furthermore, if the defendant needs to interview the witness, certainly the court has the discretion to do that. Um, but what, what the case is saying is that unless there's some bad faith, and that unless the state is trying to hide specific evidence, uh, the court is as the discretion to allow a witness to testify, even though it didn't appear, or the witness didn't appear on the witness line. Sure. Okay. So you a report right quick, Miss Long, report right quick, man. I do have some case sites if, if you like. Young, know, why is she is, isn't available? Why didn't they let me know way before this? You know, 17, is it 17, 16, 1, 17, 16, 4? That you're supposed to be on the witness list? And we'll ask that. What, what else, if anything else? Mm -hmm. so. I, just, I just have a problem with them bringing people in here on the witness list and I ain't on that body. You know, they're supposed to be prepared. You know, they, they don't want me to use certain evidence, but they're going to come in here and use a witness that ain't even on their witness list. Can they tell us why she's not here? Was she dismissed? Did she, you know, why Why was she just taking? I understand the question. I was like, that. Um, I may have to ask the witness. I'm not sure why Amber Sloan isn't here. I know she doesn't work there anymore, but I don't know the circumstances. Well, what caused you to file? You filed an additional discovery response last Friday. Yes, sir. Listener, what caused you to do that? Because we discovered that in May of this year, she tested the Xanax and El Prazolam. We didn't. We had no idea that she had done that. This witness, correct. But also, this witness peer reviewed Miss Amber Sloan's drug test for the cocaine. Now we were we we did become aware of that about a, a week ago. So is, is Amber Sloan going to testify? No, young. And when did you learn of this witness then? I mean, if you're asking me personally, it's been within the past week. I, I can't speak for the entire office. Well, I mean, I think that's relevant. I, I, I agree. You need to find out when you are. Okay. Okay. It's been about three weeks. And this was filed on Friday? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what else? I mean, you want to talk to me about the delay in doing that? I mean, it's just an oversight on the state's end. Right. It, was, it was not bad faith. We're not trying to hide anything. It's just an oversight. 
there's a lot of evidence, a lot of witnesses, and, and I'm not making any excuses, I'm just being honest with you. So what is your suggestion for this remedy? Well, the remedies that the case law discusses, that if the defense feels like they're at somehow some sort of disadvantage, then we wait on calling the witness and give the defendant an opportunity to interview uh, the witness if she says anything different from Ms. Amber Sloan. But typically, the courts don't simply exclude witnesses. Uh, if bad faith is involved, if there isn't some sort of underhandedness or trying to disclose certain facts from coming out, that's not what is occurring in this case. Ms. Hood, anything else? testimony you're about to present before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So you got it. Yes, I do. Please be seated. Um, Ms. Horton, if you would, please state your full name and spell your last name for the court. My full name is Mary Elizabeth Horton. My name is last name is spelled H-O-R-T-O-N. And um, Ms. Horton, where do you work? I am retired from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations Division of Forensic Sciences, that's commonly known as the State Crime Lab. I work in the Trace Evidence Section as a microanalyst. And how many years did you work for the GBI as a forensic analyst? I worked for the GBI a total of 36 years. I worked approximately 17 and a half years as a microanalyst. And uh, basically, what is a micro microanalyst? And what do you do? As a microanalyst, I was asked to typically look at <clears throat> items to see if there could have been a transfer of materials between 
the two items, or um, in the case of fracture matches, to, to determine if two items that were cut, torn, or somehow separated had at one time been one item. Typically, my, my area of expertise was paints and polymers, and so the, when I was looking for materials, that was what I was looking for was paints and plastics. All right. And um, can you briefly describe your educational background that allows you to do what you do? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from Georgia State University. I've completed approximately um, 18, 19 month long training program at GBI on the analysis of paints and polymers. I uh, also completed a approximately three month long training program on the analysis of fracture matches. Uh, I attended several different um, courses through the FBI and other universities that were off workshops that were offered through universities um, during my career. And ma'am, do you hold any certifications? I am a fellow with the American Board of Criminalistics. My specialty area is paints and polymers. And um, do you, um, have you ever taught anyone else, either formally or informally, in the field of uh, forensic analysis or as a microanalyst? As a microanalyst, I was asked to train at least two people in the, in the analysis of paints and polymers. And have you ever testified before as an expert? Yes, I have. In what field? I have offer testimony in, the, in uh, paints and polymers, fracture matches, and also area called general materials. And uh, do you recall uh, approximately how many times you testified as an expert? This number is really off the top of my head, but I think it was somewhere between 30 and 35 times. And do you recall what jurisdictions or courts you have appeared before and testified as an expert? I testified for probation revocation hearings. I also testified in superior courts in the state of Georgia at various uh, counties throughout the state of Georgia. And um, I believe I probably testified in probate court. I'm not absolutely sure about that. Your Honor, at this time, we would tender um, and support as an expert uh, in the field as a micro analyst. Any objection? Uh, no, sir. Yeah. Now, you've already alluded to this idea of, of looking at items and determining fracture matches. Can you sort of describe the process that you go through when you receive items and you're trying to determine if there is a fracture match? Fracture matches performed on case on um, uh, items in which um, a single item, a, a complete item object, at one time had been a had been either cut, torn, or somehow separated. Um, then I would be asked to to look at them and see if I could determine if they were at one time one and a, one and a single piece. Um, so basically, I would, after opening the package, I, I would look at the items and just basically see, are they, do they look alike? You know, am I looking at duct tape, uh, question duct tape to known duct tape? Am I looking at a piece of plastic from a cup to a, to a cup that's missing material? Basically, you are looking to make sure first that the two, two items that you're gonna look at appear to be the same. When you look at duct tape, um, duct, you know, a lot of people say duct tape is duct tape. Well, you look at it to make sure that the, the plastic backing on the duct tape is the same color. And then you look at the adhesive to see if the adhesive is the same color. And then you can look at things like the screen fabric to see if it is constructed in the same way. And during this process of uh, determining whether there is a fracture match, do you utilize any type of instruments? The first basic thing that you use is your eyes to be sure that um, things do look alike. Then if you do need to get down on the microscopic level and begin to look at um, detail that is present on, on the microscopic level, then you might use um, a various types of microscopes for fracture matches typically. And are the procedures you just described, are they generally accepted by the scientific community? 
Yes, they are. And are these procedures reliable and reproducible? Yes, they are. And are these procedures based on valid scientific theory? Yes, they are. Now, back on April 18, 2011, um, did the crime lab receive evidence um, in regard to duct tape that was recovered from a cabinet? Um, my records indicate that on um, March 28, there was evidence received in the laboratory that was duct tape. Okay. And um, with regard to your notes, were they items 13 and 14? They were entered in the laboratory with a uh, unique laboratory case number, and then a, each item was given its own unique item number, 13 and 14, yes. All right. With regard to item 14, what was that item? Item 14 is a sealed package containing the sections of duct tape identified as from the trunk of a Cadillac. And item 13? The laboratory's item 13 it was a sealed package containing duct tape identified as from the right front floorboard of the Cadillac. Right. Now with regard to these sections of duct tape, is it important that you kind of stretch out the duct tape and make sure and ensure that they don't fold on themselves and make it more difficult for testing? Typically, um, what you receive is you, you typically receive one will be a roll of duct tape and hopefully that is still a complete intact or uh, a partially used roll. I should say totally intact, but a, a partially used roll. And then often the other duct tape, if it has been used at all, it may be um, folded back upon itself, so you, you do have to very carefully, uh, try not to stretch it, but you very carefully try to um, open up the duct tape so that you can expose any ends that have been either cut, torn, or somehow separated. And once that process occurs, if you ever use, say, a pizza box in order to store those, those pieces? Typically because um, these items will usually go to another section for other analyses to be performed. Once the um, process of, of taking the duct tape apart from itself, then yes, we do usually mount it on something like a cardboard box or a, uh, it may actually go on a piece of plastic, an open plastic bag or something like that, and then we put into a cardboard box for stability. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to show um, this important what's already been tendered at the state's exhibits 86 and 87. Now, starting with State's Exhibit 86, do uh, you recognize that tip, right? This item has, is identified with not only the um, Division of Forensic Sciences Board code label, it's also, I have uh, written the case number and also the item number, and these are my initials on here, and, and this, the, um, there's also a, a seal that I need um, that bears my initials also. And can you look inside the bag and just see if, if that's the item you would call? Um, using in your testing process? Yes, this, this is the um, roll of partial duct tape that I, I examined for this in this instance. Okay. And when states exhibit 87, do you recognize that particular item? This is the um, box that I would have placed the items of duct tape into after I separated them. Again, it has the division of forensic sciences barcode label with our case number. I've written the case number, the item number, and there are my initials. And I also sealed the package. Um, once I put everything inside of it. And was there, uh, when you received these packages, were there any signs of damage or tampering? No, there was not. Okay. 
and looking at States Exhibit 8 and 7, do you recognize the items? These are, these are the uh, items of duct tape that I analyzed. Now, when you receive these items, what specific test was requested of you? I was asked to, to perform a fracture match comparison um, between the roll of duct tape and the sections of duct tape. And did you um, perform uh, the process that you've already described on these two pieces of, of evidence? Yes, I did. And based on the procedures you, you performed, your education, your experience, uh, and your, your expert opinion, did you form an opinion as to whether there was a fracture match? Yes, I did. And what was that opinion? After examination and comparison of the torn ends of duct tape sections with the torn end of the duct tape roll, I was not able to find any association by fracture comparison. Now, did you do any additional testing on these items? I did not do any additional testing, no. Okay. Um, did you uh, make a suggestion in your uh, official report that an, an additional test could be performed? I, I did make a note that um, these items are similar in appearance and are suitable for a compositional comparison that could be performed at a later date. And what is a compositional comparison? A compositional comparison looks uh, at the um, composition of the duct tape. It, it looks at the backing to see what the um, what type of backing is on is the, the plastic backing is, and then the adhesive to see what kind of adhesive it is, and then it also looks at the uh, scrim fabric, which can um, be composed of various fabrics. I'd like to show you what's been marked in States Exhibit 735. Did I miss a 734? No, Your Honor, the, and those were marked on exhibits for the preceding witness, okay. so we'll, we'll have to come back to those. Ms. Uh, Horton, do you recognize State's Exhibit 735? This is a copy of my report on the fracture match. And does it fairly and accurately um, present the testing and the procedure you use as well as your conclusions for the fracture match? Yes, it does. I understand it's in our state's exhibit 735. Any objection? No, sir, no. One moment. No. Let, me, let me just ask you a, a couple of questions to sort of clarify what you mean by a fracture match. Um, are, when you say there is no fracture, is there an objection? Yes, sir, young. I would ask that they're going to admit this, that it don't go out with the jury because that will violate the continuing testimony. It's like a continuing testimony. We'll, we'll take that up. Okay. okay. And, and proceed, young. Right. Um, when, when you indicated to the jury that there was not a fracture match, um, are you saying that? The pieces that you examined did not come from the role you examined. Is that what you're indicating? I, maybe I didn't fully explain. When you when you perform a fracture match and you do have a positive fracture match, you are able to say that this item, that the broken item, came from the original item and no other item in the world. This um, in this particular exam that I did, and I don't think I finished making the statement, is that um, I was. My examination revealed no association by fracture match, so therefore, I, it was not. I cannot conclude that the duct tape sections and the duct tape were at one time the same line. Right. 
But you are not saying that those pieces of tape did not come from that duct tape. You're just saying the way they're torn or the way they were removed, there's no uh, specific match to the two items. Is, is that correct? That is correct. I, I was not able to find an association of the fracture, the fractured or the torn ends. Um, if the items had not been similar in all of those areas that I talked about, the color of the backing, the color of the adhesive, the uh, construction of the scrim fabric that is is in between the adhesive and the backing, if all of those had not been alike, then I would not have proceeded to look at the torn ends because if if the adhesive on one piece had been gray and the other adhesive had been all white, then there would have been no reason to look for a um, fracture match because they were totally not the same thing. But in this instance, because everything looked to be the same, then I did look for the fractured ends to see if I could find a correspondence between those fractured ends, and that is what I was not able to find was the correspondence. All right. Thank you. No, no, we just ask Mike to come in. The uh, sound guy it says it won't take but 30 seconds to do this back. Good afternoon, Ms. Webb. If you will, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to present before this court? Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. I do. Please be seated. If you will, could you state your full name and spell your last name for the court? Yes, my name is Kristen Webb, W E B B. And Ms. Webb, uh, where do you work? I'm employed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigations Division of Forensic Science. And uh, what is it that you do with the GBI Forensic uh, the Department of Forensic Sciences? Yes, I'm a scientist in the trace evidence section there. Okay. And you also go by the, um, the term a microanalyst. Yes, the scientists in the trace evidence section are often referred to as microanalysts. All right. And um, do you have certain specialties or certain um, functions that you perform separate and apart from, say, other employees? Yes, there's several different types of evidence that we analyze in the trace evidence section. Of those types, I perform exams in gunshot residue analysis, glass comparisons, paints, plastic, polymers. I have objections. I'm looking at a photo I don't have the report. The report she testifying to, I've got reports on service experts. So I would like to have a report. That, you know, if she gonna testify something, I want to say this one. I don't know if there's a report. Yes. There's a report for Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean I can make a copy. 
your educational background that allows you to do what you do? Yes, um, I earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice from the University of Georgia prior to being employed by the GBI Crime Lab. Um, upon entering the trace evidence section at the GBI Crime Lab, for each of the types of evidence that I do perform analyses on, I underwent a specific training program for that evidence type. And I don't know if I asked you this, how long have you been doing this sort of um, I've been with the GBI Crime Lab for about eight years now, specifically in the trace evidence section for almost seven years. And did you work anywhere else prior to the GBI Crime Lab? Um, well, within the GBI Crime Lab, I did work in the morgue as a medical examiner investigator. That was my first job right out of college, and then I transferred to the trace evidence section. And do you hold any uh, certifications? Yes, sir, I do. I am certified by the American Board of Criminalistics, specifically in reference to trace evidence, paints, and polymers. And um, have you had any specialized training with regard to uh, compositional um, comparisons? Yes, um, many of the types of evidence that I look at are compositional comparisons. For instance, paints, polymers, glass, Tape is a subset of plastics. Those are all compositional exams. So in addition to going through the training at the GBI Crime Lab, I have attended classes throughout the nation um, in reference to those materials. Perfect. And can you just briefly describe to the jury what do you mean by compositional comparisons? A compositional comparison is typically what we're given is a question sample and a sample of known origin. What you're going to do is you're going to look at the composition, what makes up those products that would involve looking at the physical properties, the chemical properties down to the molecular level. And you're going to do a comparison to see if you see any differences between those two items to see if you can say, are these items dissimilar, meaning the question source did not come from the known item, or are all the properties alike? And then you can make a conclusion as to the association of those two types. Thank you. Now, um do you belong to any professional organizations? Yes, um, I belong to SAFS, which stands for the Southern Association of Forensic Scientists. I also belong to ASTI, which stands for the American Society of Trace Evidence Examiners. Have you ever uh, taught other people in the field of being a microanalyst, whether formally or informally? Yes, I did have the opportunity to train one of our analysts in the area of gunshot residue analysis. Now, have you ever testified as an expert before? Yes, sir, I have. And in what field? I have testified predominantly for gunshot primer residue analysis, but also for paints and fractured materials. And um, about how many times have you been qualified as an expert? Um, about 30 times. And do you recall what jurisdictions or courts you have testified before? Um, yes, various ones across the state of Georgia, Clark County included, Fulton, DeKalb, Cherokee, Chatham. Um, I couldn't list them all for you, but numerous ones throughout the state. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time we would like to tender Ms. Kristen Wedham as an expert uh, in the field as a micro analyst. Any objection? No, sir. Your Honor, works with a lot of test files next to the field of microanalysts. Thank you. Now, can you briefly describe to the uh, jury when you're trying to determine uh, the compositional comparison of, say, two items, what sort of process or procedure do you go through in, in trying to make that determination? Um, it's actually going to vary depending on the type of evidence that I'm looking at, but specifically in regards to tape comparisons. 
Um, I'm always going to begin with the physical characteristics of the tape. That's where you're going to see the most variation right off the bat. Um, you can just imagine there's various different types of tape, for instance, duct tape, electrical tape, packaging tapes. And those are obviously distinguishable from each other based on color and even just the way that the tape feels. If you then take it to just looking at duct tapes, you're going to see a lot of variation in duct tapes based on the color of the backing, the thickness of the backing, the way it looks. Um, the next layer of the tape is what we call a scrim fabric. Um, you probably noticed when you tried to tear duct tape, it doesn't tear very easily because it has that weave pattern of fibers in it. Um, we're going to look at those characteristics. Um, and then finally, we're also going to look at the adhesive material. Um, adhesives are going to vary greatly between different types of duct tape. How sticky are they? How hard was it for you to pull that tape off? Those uh, characteristics that you noticed, we're able to look at on the chemical, microscopical, and just physical level um, and make determinations based on that. And when you're doing the chemical analysis, uh, do you use any particular instruments to assist you with that? Yes. Um, initially, when we're looking at the physical properties, we're going to use a variety of light microscopes that are just going to help us visualize the evidence at a higher magnification. Then, once we move on from looking at the physical properties, um, and we're going to take it to the next level and look at the chemical properties, we're going to use several different types of instrumentation that allow us to look at different parts of the evidence. One of those would be what is called an FTIR. Um, that stands for Fourier Transform Infrared Microspectroscopy. What that's going to do is it allows us to shine infrared light on the sample. And based on how a sample absorbs that light, we're able to determine what type of sample it is. So I'm able to tell you what type of backing material is on the tape. I'm able to tell you what type of adhesive. Is it a rubber-based? Um, is it more of a synthetic base adhesive? So things like that are properties that we're able to examine. In addition, we're going to use several different instruments to determine the elemental, com elemental composition of the samples. So that would mean, what type of elements do I actually see in the backing and in the adhesive? Do I see strontium? Do I see lead? Um, picture your periodic table. I'm looking for those elements to see what's present in them. And ultimately, what we're doing in a compositional comparison is I'm looking at a known source of tape and a question source, and I'm looking at those properties and I'm trying to see is there any differences between the two. And these procedures that you just described to the jury, are these procedures uh, generally accepted in the scientific community? Yes, they are. And are these procedures uh, reliable and reproducible? Yes, sir. And are these procedures based on valid scientific theory? Yes, they are. Now, um, if you will, if I can show the um, witness states exhibit 86 and 87. Do you have um, gloves up there where you Yes, sir, I do. You go put those on. begin by asking, first of all, do you recognize those items that have already been entered in evidence? We'll start with the State's Exhibit 86. Yes, I do. And uh, how do you recognize that particular item? Um, this item of evidence I recognize by our DOFS seal, our barcode, which stands for Division of Forensic Science. Um, it has a unique case number on it, as well as a unique item number that the lab has given to this piece of evidence so that we can track it. And I also recognize, I initialed it when I opened the evidence as well, so I recognize it that way. All right. Can you pull the item out of that? Yes. And is, is that the item you, you recall testing for the compositional comparison? Yes, it is. And I know that because in here on the core, I wrote the case number and added my initials as well. And do you have any idea where this item came from? Are you given that sort of information when you're doing your testing? Yes, we're giving submission forms and also by looking at the evidence packaging. 
Um, I'm told that this item of evidence came from the right front floorboard of a Cadillac. Right, thank you. Now, did you receive any items for comparison? Yes. Um, Is that State's Exhibit 87? Yes, that would be State's Exhibit 87. Can you open that? And, well, first of all, how do you recognize State's Exhibit 87? Um, State's Exhibit 87 has that same DOFS barcode with the same case number. However, it has a different item number. Um, and also, I see my initials from when I opened the evidence. Would you mind opening the box and take, taking a look at the item? And are those the items you performed in your comparison? Um, yes, sir. All right. And do you mind just, if you can, sort of explain to the jury? Um, yeah, you can see right here, this is the original packaging that the tape came in. And just for ease, it was placed in this box so that the tape could be spread out. And uh, thank you. And. With regard to these particular items, um, did you begin with a visual inspection of the two items? Yes, um, you're always going to begin with a visual inspection of the packaging first. In this instance, um, the packaging had already been seen by several other sections in the lab before I got it. So I was able to compare images in the case file of how the evidence originally came in and look at other analyst notes to make sure that the integrity of the evidence was maintained. Um, so I'm going to examine that and take notes on the outer packaging, and then I'm going to proceed to taking notes on the physical characteristics that I see of the items inside. Now, I neglected with respect to States Exhibit 87. Do you have any idea where those items came from? Um, those items came from, they're identified by the submission form and the evidence packaging as being from the trunk of a Cadillac. And when you received both of these items, were there any signs that the items had been damaged or tampered with? Um, no, I could see evidence that it had undergone other exams in the section, though. Now, after you do your visual uh, examination in your comparison, what, what step did you take next? Um, after I did the visual exam, I noted characteristics such as backing color, the width, the thickness, I described the weave of the fabric that's in the duct tape. I looked at the adhesive, the color, the granules inside of the adhesive, and I made note of all those properties. And then once I didn't see any differences between the question tape uh, that was identified as coming from the trunk and the known roll of duct tape that was identified as coming from the floorboard, I then moved on and examined the chemical characteristics and the organic characteristics of some of the instrumentation that I mentioned earlier. Um, once my exam was complete, I was then able to come to a conclusion um, concerning these two types of evidence. Okay, and based on your training, your experience, and uh, your education, what was that opinion? Um, my opinion in regards to this case was that the physical and chemical characteristics of the backing, the scrim fabric, and the adhesive were alike between the known roll of duct tape and the question pieces of duct tape. Therefore, the question pieces of duct tape either originated from that roll of duct tape or another roll of duct tape with the same distinct properties. Now, did you record your findings in the, in the testing procedures you went to uh, went through in an official GBI forensic report? Yes, I did. I'm showing you what's been marked in States Exhibit 736. <coughs> and I would ask, do you recognize States Exhibit 736? I do. And what is it? State's Exhibit 736 is a DOFS official report that has that same case number. It has the items of evidence listed, and on the back it has the signature um, at the end of it. And does that uh, official forensic report fairly and accurately represent your testing procedures and your uh, conclusions from, from that testing? 
Yes, I'm looking at a copy of the report that I brought and looking at this one, and they are the same. They are this time the state moves its ender of state's exhibit 736. Any objection? No, sir, you all submitted. Nothing further. Thank you. Mm -hmm. cross the same Just brief. Just brief. Uh, afternoon, Ms. Williams, what's your name, ma'am? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Can y'all hear me? Okay. Ma'am, uh, isn't it true that Ms. Fortune examined that they take taken before you did? Um, yes. Um, based on the chain of custody that I see, I see that it did go into the possession of Ms. Horton, and I was able to see an official report released by her. Okay. I know that you and her say you can't tell 100% where that particular item come from, like you said, there was a difference there. What was that difference? Um, I'm sorry, what, what was the difference? Yes, ma'am. Um, I actually noticed no differences in my exam. However, duct tape is made in batch. Um, so while these two types of duct tape, or these two items of duct tape, had all the same properties that I was able to examine, I'm not able to say to the exclusion of all other rolls of duct tape. Um, that's not something that this examination can do. Um, I am able to say that it's, the duct tape would have to have the same distinct <coughs> properties to be like this. Ma'am, did, did you say something that you know about like gunpowder or anything? Did you, did I hear you say that? You was an expert in gunpowder or anything like that, ma'am? Um, not gunpowder specifically, um, gunshot residue, slightly different than gunpowder, but yes, that's one of the types of evidence I look at. Okay, what is this gunpowder residue? Could you tell us about that? Um, gunpowder residue is not something that I do, but I do look at gunshot primer residue. Um, gunshot primer residue is an exam that we perform. Typically, we look at the hands of the subjects, samples that have been taken from the hands, and we analyze those to see if particles from the primer of the ammunition are present. With gun rock, like they said, somebody get shot with a gun at close range. With gunpowder residue, get on them clothes. Um, yes. Okay, could you tell the jury how would a gunpowder residue get on the clothes? Um, when a gun is fired, um, many particles come out of that gun. Um, that's going to be particles from the powder of the ammunition, particles from the cartridge case, particles from the primer. Um, the gun gets so hot and it reaches high pressures that all those particles are forced out and they do land on the surrounding surfaces where a gun has been fired. Okay. Now if you real close up on the item, just say this right here. If I fire the gun, this close with it. Would that gunpowder rest get on this if it is close? Yes. So if you got, I mean the gunpowder residue will be able to indicate how close, how far away you away somebody off they fire gun or something. Is that correct? Um, I would like to make a distinction. I don't look at powder residue, I look at primer residue. So looking at powder residue is an exam that the firearm section of our lab does, and they do do distance determinations. That's not exactly what I'm looking at. Okay, but is, could, it, could it have no, from, you know, residue from gone, if you one foot, two, three, all the way, don't they, and, and that's why they have the gunpowder residue test, man? Um, yes, it's going to depend on a lot of factors, how much gunshot residue, if any, is present. But yes, if you fire a gun, gunshot residue would be produced. Okay, just if I fire, fire a gun from here to that American flag over there, gunpowder residue won't get on that from here, with it? Your Honor, I'm going to object to this point. She's not qualified in that type of gunshot residue determination. I'm going to sustain that objection. No more questions. Uh, just one follow-up question. You indicated you, you are familiar with gunshot primer residue, is that correct? Yes, sir. And that's typically found on, on the hands of somebody that is shot a, a weapon or fired a weapon, is that correct? Um, yes, and on people that are in the surrounding area, okay. yes. If, let me ask you this, if somebody that is involved in a situation like that but doesn't get apprehended until seven days later. Would, it, would that uh, expanse of time affect anyone's ability to determine gunshot residue? Yes, um, gunshot residue particles. If he told me I'm going to ask no question, she don't ask her, why he you object to a particular question? Yeah, but he, 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 he's saying that she's not no expert. I couldn't talk about it. Why he come behind me doing the same thing? I think the differences between power and primer. Okay, then what difference? 
So I'll, I'll go through the okay. checklist. Thank you. And, and let me re-ask the question. With regard to gunshot residue finding, would the fact that someone was uh, not apprehended for several days, could that interfere with your ability to determine that sort of test on a, on a suspect? Yes, when we look at samples, it's very important for us to know the amount of time between the alleged incident and when the collection occurred because these particles don't last forever. They begin to fall off even immediately after they've been deposited. So within a window, and it's typically thought to be between 8 and 10 hours, you're no longer going to see gunshot residue on somebody's hands even if they did fire a weapon. But that's going to depend on um, the activities of the individual. Did they wash their hands? Did they wipe their hands over their clothing? It's highly variable in what causes that to happen. But yes, it's going to begin to fall off. Thank you. Would it fall off clothing? Um, it would fall off clothing. However, clothing's a little different. It's a fabric. It's a weave. It's not like your hands that are just a flat surface. Um, the weave's going to retain those particles a little longer than hands would. Okay. So how long would it be on clothing? Um, I can't give an amount of time to that because it's so variable between different amounts of clothing. Um, so, for instance, we don't typically look at clothing items in our section for GSR. It's an exam that we can do that has to have manager approval, and it's because I can't place an incident time on that because that GSR, gunshot primer residue, could have been there indefinitely on clothing. Okay, but you would agree that if a person close enough on somebody they got them clothed, it, it, it would get on them. Is that correct, ma'am? Um, it's possible. It's going to be harder to transfer from a weed pattern in the clothing than it would, per se, from hands, but it is a possibility. No further questions, ma'am. Thank you. Nothing from her. Thank you. She'll be excused. I'm going to No, sir. She's excused. Call you next week. Got it. I'm going to take a 10 minute recess. Recalls Stephanie Menendez. Ma'am, I'll just remind you you're still in the room. Can you please have a seat? Scoot up the microphone. Thank you. Um, I believe when we left off, you were just tendered as an expert. Do you recall? Yes. Okay. And uh, let me ask you, um, with regard to identifying unknown substances, can you sort of give the jury an idea how that process occurs? Um, yes. When we get a, a piece of evidence and we don't know what it might contain, um, we do, first I do a preliminary examination, which narrows down what type of drug it could be, and then I do a confirmatory test, which gives me an idea of what the structure is of this molecule of this drug. And when you're trying to determine what a particular drug is, do you use chemicals, do you mix chemicals together to determine that? How do you determine that? Um, we. It depends on the drug. Um, in this case... Well, let's just say, for the example, in cocaine. In what, cocaine. What would you do for cocaine? For cocaine, I would dissolve it in solvent of ethanol because it is soluble in that. Okay. So you would say if it's a powdered substance, you would put it in a, a watery substance? Ethanol is like an alcohol. alcohol. Okay. And uh, what are you looking for when you do that? That is just to dissolve the drug in a um, matrix that we can work with so we can perform our other tests. Okay, so you need to get the powder form into a liquid form. Yes. Okay, and then what do you do next? I perform a preliminary examination. Okay, and when you do that, what are you doing? I am um, trying to narrow down what it could be, so it's, I'm trying to get an idea of 
what drug class, if you may, that it contains. Okay, are you running the substance through some sort of instrument, or are you looking at it under a microscope? What are you doing with it? With the preliminary examinations? Yes. Um, it depends. We have several ways to perform a preliminary examination for cooking, and for example, I would do what is called a thin layer chromatography, which is not an instrument, but it's a separation technique. So if I have a mixture, let's say cocaine is mixed with something else, this, depending on the physical and chemical characteristics of cocaine or whatever substance is in it, will separate on um, in thin layer chromatography. Now, once you um once you go through, say, an examination and an analysis, and you come up with a conclusion, are your results or any other crime lab results, are they reviewed by someone else? Yes, all of our... And, and, and what is that process called? All of our results and all of our reports are peer reviewed by another scientist. Okay, and when you peer review someone else's work, what exactly are you doing? We are looking at their data, the data produced by all preliminary examinations and confirmatory examinations. Um, we are making sure that they follow all of our GBI policies and we come to, we have to come to the same conclusion and then we would release a report But if we disagree that not all policies were followed, that I do not disagree with, I mean agree with your conclusion, we would reject the result. Okay. And um, when you're looking at someone else's data, when you talk about data, what are you referring to? Um, for, like I already spoke about, thin layer chromatography, that is a plate, and they take a picture of this plate. Um, and then for our confirmatory test, they usually run on instruments, and they print, there's a printout of the results, and we are viewing that. And in this case, involving a cocaine that was examined at the crime lab, did you perform a peer review of anyone? I performed the peer review of the report and the data. All right. Um, Your Honor, at this time, may I see Exhibit 726? I'm showing you what's already been tendered in the heaven and states exhibit 26. Um, uh, and one of the items was preliminarily identified as, as cocaine. Do you recall if this particular item was tested by anyone in your crime? The reporter received uh, stated that Amber Sloan tested the item positively identified as cocaine. Okay. And when you um, when you um, learned that she had uh, already identified this item, did you do a peer review of her, her analysis and her work? I was asked to do a peer review or reassessment of her data and report. Okay, and did you do that? Yes, I did. And did you come to um, your own conclusion as to what the substance was based on reviewing that data and your personal involvement in the peer review? Um, evaluating the data found in the case file, I concluded that the result on the original report was correct. 
And did you review that original report as well? Yes, I did. I wanted to show you what's been marked in State's Exhibit 734. State's Exhibit 734, is this the report you reviewed? Yes, it is. And um, does it fairly and accurately reflect uh, those res uh, results that you reviewed? You peer -reviewed? Uh, the data that I reviewed, yes, it does. And did you, uh, looking at this uh, report and the conclusions, did you arrive at the same conclusion independent of, of her? Conclusion. Evaluating her data, um, yes, I did come up with the same result. Owner of the Stainless Tender States Exhibit 734. Uh, no, sir, you don't. Yes, only thing I would object to is going back with the jury because they're continuing testimony. But I do have no objection. Okay, okay brother. Thank you. Just briefly. Afternoon, Ms. Menendez. Menendez. Okay, afternoon, ma'am. Afternoon. Okay, you said you did a report for uh, Ms. Alma Sloan? I reassessed her data. Okay, did she originally do a report on this case on 8 March 29, 2011, ma'am? That is what her report says. Okay, why did she have to check her place? What happened here? Ms. Amber, no, I'm um, sorry, Ms. Sloan no longer works at the GBI. What, what happened? Why is she, why is she no longer work there? I do not know. One of the disciplinary reports that knows that like that was. I do not believe so. You believe so? You know so? I do not know. Okay. Yeah. So you examined the whole work and to see if she done it the right way. I examined this the data in this case. Did they did they spare her or five up for doing something illegal with tests or anything like that? I do not know. Is this why they had you to go over her work because she might have been doing something that she had not been doing? I do not know that. Did she say they had any fingerprints of Jamie Hood that said there would be cocaine in that car? Excuse me? Did they have any fingerprints belonging to Jamie Hood, me, saying there was my cocaine in that car? Uh, I only do drug identification, so I do not know of any evidence for fingerprints were submitted. Do you know of any fingerprints pertaining to Jamie Hood? I, do, I cannot answer that question. I only work under the drug identification section. That is another section in our agency. Okay. No further questions, ma'am. Thank you. Just one follow-up question. Uh, I just want to clarify something. This idea of peer review, is that always done in every case? Peer review is done in every case. Okay. So. It, it has nothing to do with whether you think somebody is messing up or not. It's just a quality control type of procedure that's in place. That is correct. All of our cases are peer reviewed before they are released. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. No, no sir. Right. I'm going to go back. Thank you. You should be excused. Uh, no, sir. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Probably next Let's take a call, Ashley Hood, Your Honor. Was a sneeze? I didn't even hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're allowed to sneeze. Ma'am, before you sit down, I'm just going to ask you to raise your right hand for me, would you? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth so you got? I do. Thank you. Can you please have a seat? And if you could kind of pull towards that microphone, state your name and spell your name for the record. Absolutely true. A-Z-A-L-E-U. 
Who is H O O D? And you're at a good distance there, so uh, I think I'll be able to hear you just fine from that distance. And um, Ms. Hood, do you know the defendant, Jamie Donnell Hood? Yes, I do. And how do you know him? He's my son. Okay. And back in March of 2011, where were you living? 100 Granite Road, Winterville. And approximately how long did you live at that address, 100 Granite Road in Winterville? I'm going to say about 16, 17, maybe 18 years. And I just need you to speak a little bit louder, okay? 16 to 18 years, a little more. And before you lived at 100 Granite Road, where did you live? Um, before I moved to Granite Road, it was at Hallmark Trailer Park and from Park Avenue from Elberton. Okay. Uh, how long uh, were you and your family in Athens, Georgia? Over 20 something years. Okay. Is that pri primarily where your son Jamie Hood grew up? Yes, a little bit. Jamie was about six, maybe seven when we moved. Okay. So did he basically attend all of his elementary school years in Clark County? Almost. Okay. And then his middle school years were those also here in Clark County? Yes. And then did he go to Cedar Shoals High School here in Clark County? Yes. Okay. Back on March 22nd of 2011, do you recall who was living with you at 100 Granite Road? Yes. Who was living with you? Robert, my husband, Stephen, my son, and Nikeria, my granddaughter, okay. and myself. Uh, do you recall where your son Jimmy Hood was living? Uh, I think it's Sigma. When you say Sycamore, are you referring to Sycamore Drive? Yeah. Okay. And did you have another son that was living over there? Yes, Stephen. Okay. Did they live, did your son Stephen Hood and your son Jamie Hood live together, or did they live in separate apartments? A separate apartment. But both up Sycamore Drive? Yes. And back on March 22nd of 2011, do you recall what you did that day? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm going to go back to that night, that evening. When you say you're going to the evening, do you mean the evening before March 22nd? Yes. Okay, so the evening of March 21st would have been a Monday. Does that sound right? Uh, uh, Jamie had put a tail light, no, a tag light on uh, my vehicle. Stephen had got a ticket. And uh, they said if we bring proof that he had fixed it, they would dismiss the ticket. Okay, so on March 21st, 2011, your son Jamie Hood came up to your house to fix a tag light? Yes. And uh, did you have to go somewhere the next morning because of that tag light? Yes, I got up. Now, Curie got on the bus. We uh, left out and went to uh, the courthouse. When you say we left out, who are you referring to? Stephen, Robert, myself, and we took Now Curie to school. Okay. When you left the house, was anyone out the house? When nobody at the house when we left. Okay. And so you said that you had to go to the courthouse? Yeah, we had to go to the courthouse. We left the courthouse, went to one of the uh, little courthouse, and then we left there and went to the um, license place, State Patrol. And when you say the State Patrol place, do you mean out Georgia, of, Georgia out State of, Patrol. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do you mean the, the Georgia State Patrol office out on 129? Yeah. Okay. And what did you do at the Georgia State Patrol office? Stephen got his license reinstated, and we went back to the courthouse, showed them. Then he had an appointment at Advantage at 11, we went there. Okay. So let me, get the, let me just say, make sure I understand. You, you had a, a court date on the morning of March 22nd, 2011, is that right? Mm -hmm. And I need you to answer yes or no. Yes. Okay. And you left from there to go to the Georgia State Patrol to deal with an uh, issue with Stephen's license. Right. Then you had to go back to the courthouse to show what you had done at the Georgia State Patrol. Yes. And then from there you went where? To Advantage. And why did you go to Advantage? Stephen had an appointment. And do you remember what time that was? 11 o'clock. Okay. 11 o'clock that morning? Yes. Okay. And what did you do after the appointment? Well, we dropped Stephen off and I went to the Golden Patch. I would go there and talk to Christine every day. And the Golden Pantry, uh, which 
Golden Pantry are you talking about? East Broad. The one on East Broad Street? Yes. And do you know what street that's near off the Atlanta Highway there on East Broad Street? That Golden Pantry? Well, you got all those on, uh, yeah, all those on Broad Street probably. And let me see if I can make sure I understand which one you're talking about. If you're leaving downtown and heading west, mm -hmm. would you be heading in the direction towards Sycamore? Yes. And would there be a Golden Pantry? Which side of the street would it be on? The right. On the right-hand side. Would that be before you got to the Alps area where they have Hawthorne and Alps? It would be before that. Okay. So it's between downtown and Alps. Is that Yeah, you got two Golden Pantry on there, brother. That's right. And I just want to talking about the first one? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you, what did you do at the Golden Pantry? Me and Christine talks, drank talks, smoked cigarettes, and played some lottery numbers. Okay. And did anything happen while you were at the Golden Pantry? Yes, brought brought me the phone and gave it to me, and uh, it was Jamie. Okay. And did you talk to your son Jamie Hood on the phone at that time? Yes, I did. And what did you do based on talking to him? I uh, talked to him. He told me to come now. And uh, went brought and picked him up. He was walking. Okay. And did you know why he was walking? No, I didn't. Did you go pick him up uh, in the area of downtown Athens? Yes, I did. Okay. Did you get all the way to Lexington Road? I got down there at that farmer's market. You know that big building said farmer, but Lexington keeps straight across. Okay. And I bad to the right going there like Toby University. Okay. So if I was in downtown heading towards Lexington Road, are you talking about the first right before you bear towards Lexington Road? That right immediately preceding that by the university? Yes. Okay. And what did you do when you took that right? I went down the street and Jamie said, hey, here I am. So we turned around, picked him up, turned around, and uh, he said, take me home. And did Jamie Hood have a Cadillac at that time? Yes. Did you, did you see him the day before? Yeah, the day before, yeah. When he came to your house? Yes. Okay. Did he ever tell you where, what happened to the Cadillac on March 22nd, 2011? No, I had the boy a car boy. He said, just take me home. Okay. And when he said take you home, where did you start to take him? Sycamore. Okay. Did you make it all the way to Sycamore Drive? No, I didn't. I, uh, Met Matthew. At, we seen Matthew, and I blowed him at Applebee. He turned in Applebee. I turned in McDonald's. So Matthew came back down to McDonald's, and Jamie got out and said, "Well, you ain't got food with me now." And uh, oh, I can't pronounce her name, baby. But I ain't gonna call her. Is her name Kianka Williams? Is that yeah. the name you're trying to yeah. say? Yes. Okay. Um, so. Tell me about Kianka Williams. Where was she? Kianka and Trey was in the vehicle with Matthew. And when you say Matthew, who are you referring to? My son. Matthew Hood? Yes. And do you recall what kind of vehicle he, he was driving? A red SUV. Okay. And so Matthew Hood was at, met you at the McDonald's on the Atlanta Highway? Yeah, he came from, he turned to Applebee, come back down the street to McDonald's, and uh, Jamie got out and went over there where he was. And uh, he told uh, Keon, Keandra, uh, who and Trey to get out. So Matthew told uh, me to take him to his house. And when you, when you say them, do you mean the Keonta Williams and the, and the person named Trey? Trey, yeah. And where was Matthew's house? Rock Springs. Okay. So Keonta and Trey got out of Matthew's vehicle and got in your vehicle. Is that right? right. And then Jamie Hood got out of your vehicle and got into Matthew Hood's red SUV. Right. Okay, and then what did you do at that point? Uh, after I took them over there, Matthew said, take them on, I'll be right on. Okay. So as we got over there, they just sitting there. I told them, get out, because I got something I got to do. I said, I'm not going to wait on y'all, but I got to be at the house, I uh, need to get out. But, okay. the, the McDonald's that you were at on the Atlanta Highway, um, how far away is that from Sycamore Drive? Nowhere, not that far. Okay. Do you, know, do you know how many lights there are between that McDonald's and Sycamore Drive? How many red lights? Two. Okay. You turn it to Sycamore uh, to Sycamore. Okay. So you pass through one red light, 
And then the second one, you take that left to veer off down Sycamore? Yes. Okay. When you dropped off Kiyanko, Williams, and Trey at Rock Springs, where did you go after that? Well, I was going to come back and clean the refrigerator out at Stephen's apartment. I was a food that spot. And uh, we turned, and uh, all I seen was a police officer pull over, pull on the side, said, don't move. And he said, can't nobody go down in there. And he said, uh, when that ambulance come out, y'all follow me. Okay. And I just want to make sure I'm clear. You said that you're going to Stephen's apartment to clean out his refrigerator. Is that right? Right. Was Stephen's apartment located on Sycamore Drive as well? Yeah, then it uh, in, yeah. Okay, and so when you tried to go to Sycamore Drive, there were police already there telling you you could not go down that road? Yes, sir. And the ambulance was already down there? Yeah, what they say. And did you see the ambulance come back out of Sycamore Drive? Yes, and I followed it. We turned around and went on out, and I went on home. Okay. Uh, at that point, did um, the uh, agents from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations come talk to you at your home that night? It was that <laughs> night when we got home, uh, it was a lot of police and things around. So I knew the chief and one of them. So I went down there, I asked him what going on. And he said, Jamie done shot the police. I said, no. I said, because we ain't been too long, I dropped him off. Okay. And did you hear from Jimmy Hood that night, Tuesday, March 22nd, 2011, after you dropped him off at McDonald's? No, I didn't. Did you hear from him on Wednesday, March 23rd? Nope. How about March 24th, that Thursday? No. When did you finally hear from your son, Jamie Donnell Hood? Jamie called me. It may have been that Friday or something. He said, Mom, I'm going to turn myself in. And he said, I said, what? He said, I'm going to turn myself in. And he said, I'm going to call you back. He said, but uh, I'm going to uh, turn myself in so Miss Creasy can have some closure to bury her son. Okay. And did agents come out to your house to take you? To another location that evening? Uh huh. Jamie called me back and told me some agent gonna be coming to pick me up, take me over to the police station. So I started over to the police station. We was on uh, Beaver Down Road and uh, at the dog pound, they stopped us and I got in the car with them. Okay. This one on, please. Thank you, Ms. Hitt. Those are all the questions I have. Uh, the defense may have some questions for you as well. Sure. This time I might have us up to recall. No question. Well, I got one on my witness, so I can call it. All right, she can go. Okay. No objection, Hunter. All right. You may shut down now. All right, next question. There's a matter we have to take them outside the premises. Jerry, at this point, we go to the 